This is the Crease Cast. Here's your host, Lock in the Crease. Sunday, December the 13th. Welcome to the Crease Cast. Um, we are exactly one month out from the start of the NHL regular season, the perceived start of the NHL regular season. Uh, supposedly, that's going to get announced on Wednesday that we're that the NHL is coming back uh, to start the season. To uh, start the season, yeah, that on that the thirteenth of December. Um, I don't know why they're waiting until Wednesday specifically. I don't. I don't know if there's some rule about that or whatever. But it seems like you'd want to give uh, everybody, not just your t- obviously the teams and the players, no more or less as much time as possible. Uh, to prepare, but also just anyone else who, uh, any adjacent, uh, like sponsors or fans or whatever, as much time as possible to, you know, build their schedule and understand and and build the idea of like, well, how is this going to go? Especially for like media people and everything else, like what, what, what this is going to be. So, but from the looks of things, it's going to be a 56 game season of the, um, 56 game regular season with the four divisions uh, with those four divisions that we talked about uh, on the last episode, I believe, if I remember correctly. Um, let's see. Um, I, I, of course, of course, the one thing I forgot to put into my into my notes here was what the um, was the official um, list of uh, divisions. Again, I forget if we talked about this already. We, I don't think it's official. Uh, let's see if I can pull it up really quickly. Pierre LeBron. Here we go. So four days ago. Okay, so I'm not completely off. Off here. Um, so here are the divisions. Basically, um, we've already talked about the Canadian division a little bit. That's the main kicker here. Is the other ones are uh, supposedly going to be Boston, Buffalo, New Jersey, the Islanders, Rangers, Flyers, Penguins, and Capitals in d- one division. The division number two will be Carolina, Columbus, Detroit, Chicago, Florida, Minnesota. Nashville and Tampa Bay, so a little bit of a, of a crossover between East and West in Division Two. Division Three is Air, uh, Anaheim, Arizona, Colorado, Dallas, LA, San Jose, St. Louis, and Vegas, in, and uh, of an entirely Western, mostly Pacific division. And then, of course, all the Canadian teams. The main kicker, of course, being that they couldn't use. Obviously, they could. The Canadian teams can't travel. So can't travel across the border right now. And there's a good chance they won't be able to at any point uh, during the season. That's from Pierre Lebrun, by the way. Um, that they won't be able to, and by which uh, for the start of the season. So they're going to need to play all their games uh, against the other teams in the division. Um, I'm excited to see how this goes. This is going to be a very fascinating year. 56 games against the same six opponents for the Canucks in this case. Um, uh, there's, I mean, for the other teams, it's going to be a little bit smaller because, again, the Canadian division is going to be the only team division with seven. It is almost a lucky break for the NHL. Well, actually, they've been talking about how this is a huge lucky break for the league that Seattle is not here yet, that there is not, that Seattle's gate got one more season. Like, even the Kraken, I think there was an, there was an article recently about how the Kraken are like, Oh my, or like, kind of like, oh, thank God they made us wait another season. Because initially they were going to start this year. That was the main plan. But of course there were delays on, um, there were a couple delays on the stadium. The I, the main one originally being that the, 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 the key arena, the Seattle renovation was not supposed to be done initially in, until I think last October or something like that, or like midway through last October, and because Seattle doesn't have, there isn't another stadium nearby for Seattle to start playing, and that's big enough to house them, that's the only one in the area, uh, the NHL was like, well, uh, you better, uh, we're going to make you wait another year, uh, instead of having you play your first couple games in a different building or something. Um, So we're going to have you start in 2021. Again, that ideally, that completely saved Seattle from what would have been an off, what could have been an awful first season. Like, imagine if they had to play their inaugural season in front of no fans. What a disaster that would have been from a just a from a financial standpoint. You pay you pay all this money and then and only to start your only to start your your inaugural campaign without any of your fans being able to see you for an entire season, most likely an entire season. Although vaccines are getting out, that's other good news. We'll get into that in a second. Um. But imagine more from just a logistical standpoint, 
if you have 32 teams, if you have all 32 of those teams and, and only seven are in Canada and you need to have a Canadian division for the sake of this, um, who chances are either you have to do the really bad, the really stupid thing of having nine, having a, one division of nine teams, which, and one of seven, which just completely would have offset, would have unbalanced the, um, the setup or more likely, or in a more, or more likely, uh, one American team has to go play all their games in Canada. Um, the qu now, I would imagine that team would have been Seattle because it would make a lot of sense for it to be like, well, Seattle, your closest rival is the Canucks, so we're going to throw you into the same... Your Washington, is ba Washington State is basically southern Canada already, so uh, why don't you just go there? It makes more sense. Although, arguments could be made that it would have made... That from a completely geogra from a pure geographical standpoint, Buffalo and Detroit are closer to Toronto, so you, one of those teams might have flipped in, but I... I think I I think in a logistical standpoint, uh, Seattle would have made the most sense to play in that Canadian division, which again would have sucked for Seattle to come into that situation. Luckily, they don't, and luckily for the league, they don't have to worry about that. All the Canadian teams are going to only have a, a little bit of a I guess is I don't even know if it's an advantage necessary. It's not. It's kind of an advantage, but at the same time, this division could frankly go to just about anyone uh, except Ottawa. Sorry, you guys are are just going to kind of be there. Um, <laughs> poor Ottawa. I mean, hey, on the bright side, you guys have great jerseys and uh, a great new jerseys and a great future. So don't worry about it, Ottawa. Um, from the Canucks standpoint, um, this is, it's going to be a very interesting year. There is, um, the Canucks, it could go either way for Vancouver. I mean, I've talked about before how Winnipeg, and there's like a couple teams in that division that really scare me from a Canucks standpoint on how they could really mess things up for the Canucks in their season up by themselves. But I think on paper, they're still better than a couple of those teams out there. Like, I know this is a bit, I know this is a bit out there, but I mean, the Canucks are still better than the Oilers, in my opinion. Um, that's, I don't know if that's a hot take. I guess that would kind of be considered one. Um, because, because again, Connor McDavid and Leon Dreisaitl by themselves are a cheat, are human cheat codes. Like, they can will it, they could pretty closely will a team into the playoffs um, nearly on their own but the Canucks from it but the Canucks are built better they are a more well-built team which is not saying much there is a lot of issues with the way the Canucks are built but they have a lot less holes than the Oilers do especially in net uh, Mike Smith and Miko Koskinen can very much can they like Mike Smith is getting you know getting not is not exactly um, getting better with age. Um, and, you know, Miko Koskinen can sometimes be great, but, uh, he's very, very, uh, he's very streaky. Sometimes he's on, sometimes he is when he's, but when he's off, he is way off. So, I mean, I think from the Canucks, from the Canucks case, they could make it in. It's just going to be a lot of who they, who they, who can they beat with, not so much with regularity as it is. Who won't they lose to with regularity? Because again, one team, if there's one team that just gets your, that just completely like breaks you down every time you play them and there's just nothing you can do to solve them, that can sink your year in by itself. So the Canucks have, the best thing for the Canucks basically is going to have to be, okay, how many, how many wins can we get on routine against every team in this division? Because that's what it's going to take. You're going to be playing against six other teams that a, a le is it uh, a, like close to uh is it it's not 10 it's not 10 i'll have to do the math in my head on how that or i can actually just pull up my calculator my calculator here i think it's a 56 game season divided by uh oops uh divided by six because you're gonna have six opponents nine in a third game so i guess you'll be playing nine games against everybody and then one last game against someone else i would imagine say uh i don't actually probably they would probably give that extra game to teams that want a, um, ooh, is that going to make any sense? I, we'll figure it out later. Um, someone's got to get an extra, you got to get an extra game in there somewhere. Um, the 56, oh, I'm guessing that 56 actually, uh, divides into, uh, seven does really well, doesn't it? Divides into seven, if I remember correct. Yes, it divides into eight, which is much easier. I don't know how they're going to figure, that's going to be an interesting, um, 
um, wrinkle to figure out because if you can only play the same, if you can only, if it's nine in the third games, 56 divided by six, you can only play nine games. That leaves one extra game. But again, there are, am I, am I doing that right? I think that would still leave one team playing a one less game. I think that doesn't make any sense. Oh, whatever. I can't do this. This is, this is not, that's not good radio. I'm not going to try and sit here and try and my, and try and get my, and just completely mess with my mind on that. Um, but, and that's great. There, it's great that hockey's coming back and that there's going to be some great stuff to talk about in regards to hockey. But, oh my God, this week, man, this, I, I, I can't lie to you guys. This week has been just a slog and not even just from a personal standpoint. I feel like every day this week, I have logged onto Twitter for, I have gone onto Twitter and some complete shit show <laughs> has been going off um, in regards to whether it's the Canucks, whether it's something in the Twitterverse, something to do with the NHL or hockey as a society in general or hockey as a culture in general. It's been a bad week. It really has been. I mean, what, from the World Juniors, a bunch of pl there's already concern that some teams are completely might, like Sweden, there's a concern that Team Sweden, because of all their COVID cases, might have to just straight up drop out of the World Juniors. That was a talking point. It doesn't sound like it's come to that, which is great. Uh, but also there's just concern of, um, like, there was already something today I read was like three teams... Um, refused to get on the plane they were supposed to go on a charter together but there wasn't enough spatial area between them because of you know uh social distancing that they refused to get on until a second plane was coming because the ihf was like gonna send them on that extra plane like good lord just a oh my god a whole lot of just stress going on in the world and everything um the world juniors are coming and i i want to do a, i'm gonna have to do bring in somebody to talk about the world juniors because um, man, there, because there's a lot of stuff that's good stuff, especially from a Canucks standpoint, that's going to be going on, uh, in that tournament, like Nils Hoglander, uh, might be coming back. Who, um, well, he's done his, uh, SHL career, uh, with Rogel, uh, according to Chris Faber, finished it with a flourish and with, uh, 25 penalty minutes, was it? Something great like that, <laughs> where he got like tossed out of the, out of his last game. It's like, well, that's, uh, that's one way to get to Vancouver faster, is it not? Um... It is. It has been. It, it has been a minute on this week, and I was. I actually did have some ideas of somebody to bring in for the show, but I decided against it because I was like, you know what? I don't want to bring somebody in to talk about all this. Like, it would be better to bring someone in, but I do not want somebody to come on this show for the first time or something to talk about just what a mess. This whole week has been, and we'll start with the Canucks stuff because this is a Canucks podcast. Specifically, the first thing that blew up this week, which was Mark Donnelly singing at a anti-mask rally, and um, there was, you know, and then the it wasn't just that. That oh my god, what are like um, for those of you who don't know, uh, Mark Donnelly, he's been uh, one of the more recognizable Canucks singer anthem singers for the last. Ooh, as long as I can remember, I remember him singing the anthem way back into when I was like five, six. Like it's been that long. Like it's been a long time. Um, usually he only came in for important games sort of thing. So he would come in, he'd sing the anthem very famously uh, after in all the son's command, he would uh, lift the mic up and everybody in the building would sing, um, would sing the rest, would sing the, ne the middle part of the song. Um, and he did that for, he's done it for years, like years. And almost every single big game, every playoff game, um, he was there for it. Um, fast forward a couple years, like a bunch of years into like 2018, 2019, around that time, he stopped doing, um, he stopped doing those of, he stopped, um, he, he went, he decided to run for a conservative <laughs> seat, for a conservative spot in the provincial government, I think it was, something like that. Um, and, uh, he did stuff like, uh, perform at an anti-abortion rally, um, and, and, uh, he's very religious, but, um, religious to the, you know, you know, religious, I'm not going to get into that whole can of worms, but, um, essentially he went to an, he did, he performed an anti-abortion rally because he believed in that sort of thing. And then there was this whole, this whole anti-mask thing. Um, and 
one of the things, and immediately, like a few, like, well, I shouldn't say immediately, but like a few hours later, after this story broke on the Vancouver Sun, um, uh, the Canucks owner, Francesco Aquilini, tweeted, hey, tweeted at, at, at si around six, he tweeted, hey, like the, he tweeted the link to it, which the link, so the link, the title on this Vancouver Sun article was Canucks anthem singer Mark Donnelly to perform at anti-masker rally, okay? Francesco Aquilini tweets, hey, at Vancouver Sun, change the headline to former Canucks anthem singer, hashtag wear a mask, boom, everybody just all of a sudden like, Francesco Aquilini, sudden weird hero turn a little bit, like, um, you know, I've been critical of Francesco Aquilini, I'm rel uh, in the past on this show before, uh, but I'll give him props where it's due of uh, of the idea of, hey, he didn't just wait for this to blow up, to die down or something, you know, and just be like, well, we're going to keep bringing up, trotting him out here and, uh, for events. Like, he was going less and less over the course of time. That was well noted. Like, that was well noted by a lot of people. Specifically, uh, I remember Daniel Wagner, uh, of Passage Bullets talking about a few years ago how when the Canadian anthem changed, uh, the lyrics from In All Thy Sons Command to In All Of Us Command, um, Don't All Of Us Command... Mark Donnelly started going into the, um, into the, uh, holding the mic up to the crowd, uh, I'll, I, I, one lyric early. That was a, that was very well noted, was that, and, uh, apparently that was in protest because he did not like that. He didn't, he, he thought it was a PC or, like, some sort of, like, PC move to change it. Um, and, the, and so there was, and there, and anyway, the, Basically, Francesco Aquilini saying, oh, he'll, yeah, he's never going to sing an anthem at this building again. A lot of people uh, love that, including myself. Uh, there was a lot of talk of, let's make Marie Huey, uh, who's done a great job singing the anthem at Canucks Games, the main anthem singer. And she was pretty much, during the playoffs, if you watched uh, any of the Stanley Cup broadcasts uh, that the Canucks were involved in, every team got to pick, whoever was the home team, they had, they chose the anthem singers for that night, for that game, or like the, their video would show up on the board. And Marie Huey's was Marie Huey was the one showing up for all the uh, for all the Canucks ones for all the Canucks games, and uh, she was just basking in the the glow, and I love that she was just like kind of like she she I think at one point she even posted like the just sitting on the couch eating popcorn emoji, and I absolutely absolutely love that like that's that's queen shit right there, um, but. Uh, Later that night, Rob Fay from TSN 1040 uh, did an interview with Mark Donnelly where Mark Donnelly called in to talk about everything. And I listened because I don't listen to much sports radio anymore, specifically because now that I do this podcast, I'm always a little bit scared to regurgitate a talking point or something or some sort of opinion or like something close or similar that I, my mind just mushes down into um, into the show and accidentally like a little bit like plagiarize somebody or somebody else's like studying or work. So I try not to do that. But I did, so I try not to listen to too much Vancouver Sports Radio. I did absolutely tune in that night to hear Mark Donnelly um, talk about why he was doing this anti-masker rally. Uh, one of the very funniest, there were a couple of very funny moments, specifically one where he criticized the media for not telling the anti-masker story. Basically, he was both trying to distance himself and say, I, 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 I don't believe this, blah, 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 or like kind of, he was kind of hinting that he's like, doesn't believe it. And you're trying to be like, oh, I'm just trying to give these people a voice when he very clearly also believes uh, that wearing a mask doesn't help. And he made that very clear later in the episode, basically contradicting himself. And then he was basically complaining that, oh, the media does not give these people the side of the story whilst he's being interviewed over it on a major sports radio network. Like, okay, there's some hypocrisy going on there. And then at one point, I even tweeted about this. He basically claimed that, oh, Anthony Fauci, the, you know, the, the, the U.S. doctor, I believe from the, from the World Health Organization, I forget his exact title, um, said, oh, masks don't work. And I'm like, okay, I don't even have to look that up to know that that's not true. Like he is, there is no way that Dr. Anthony Fauci has said masks don't work with that specific idea of you should not wear a mask because they don't help prevent COVID. Anthony, I don't have to look that up to tell you that Anthony Fauci has never said that. Now, there is a possibility that he has said something along the lines of masks don't work at, um, stop at like curing COVID because yes, that is true. Mask wearing a mask does not 
cure the disease, but it does prevent the spread of it, as literally any person with a brain can tell you. There, we're not, people aren't complaining that masks are, people aren't, ma the, whole, the whole thing with masks is, I, I, I feel like I shouldn't even have to say this, guys. Wear a damn mask. They, they work, they do help, like the, it's, the more that people that wear masks, the harder it is for the disease to travel from one person to another. But at the end of the, most importantly, at the end of the day, you're helping prevent it from someone else from getting it. And the thing that bothered me, especially is like, he's talking about, like, I think he talks about his religious beliefs at one point in this. Um, I'm, and, you know, I'm not going to go too far down that because it's, it's not my place anymore necessarily. But I will say that when I was younger, I was, I went to a Catholic school. I was raised Catholic and Christian. I went to church in, I went to church every, every month. Or uh, sometimes, actually, I generally went also week to week. My there was a there was a good amount of time where my mom was going quite reg where my family was going quite regularly, and I usually w and I went with them. Um, and yeah, and I, and I went to a Catholic private school um, where I was where uh, I was you know we went to we had a regular mass and everything. And one of the things that I I'm not going to sit here and tell you that I know a bunch about religion because again I'm not really I don't have that faith anymore. I'm not, th I'm not really of that faith myself personally. Um, but I am a believer that sometimes relig that if a rel religion at its core can hopefully teach, hopefully teaches people to be better humans to not just for themselves, but to all other people, hopefully the things that people get out of religion, whether or not your disagreements, whatever, re whether or not whatever your beliefs are, is that hopefully it makes you a better person, not just to to everybody around you, not just your friends and family, but to everybody around you. I think that's a good mindset to take from the good part of religion, necessarily. For you to go out here and say that masks don't work and that nobody should, and it's a it's a it's an infringement on beliefs. Like I don't know, that seems to me as somebody who's been Christian, who's who's had a, a who's had a good amount of uh, interaction with Christianity in his life, that seems, that kind of stance just seems like the most unchristian thing possible to me. Um, like, imagine, you know, going out of saying that, you know, not doing something because it, because it infringes on you and your, and your personal, and your personal life instead of, you know, just trying to help people, uh, and just trying to be better for everyone else. Um, but I'm, I'm not going to go any further on that. Um, what was interesting as well and came out of that was a lot of people uh, saying this is a uh, this is a he's it's his freedom you can't fire him for this like uh, and there was like one article uh, by Ken Campbell on the on the hockey news I will say I try my best to not um, go out go after writers and stuff on this or other personalities on this platform as much as possible because I. You know, because I, I don't know them. I don't know them personally. And I'm trying not to be, you know, I don't want to start like beef with people. I'm not, that's not my thing. I'm very, I don't like confrontation. But this did bother me, which was, and as especially because again, Ken Campbell, for the record, had a couple pretty good takes regarding like stuff like Black Lives Matter and LGBT. Lately, there was a bit of a, I don't necessarily love a lot of the stuff he does, but it seemed like there was kind of a good, uh, of a good arc going for him. And then he posted this where he basically, and uh, oh, I'll throw it up here, where he basically on the, the hockey news talked about how he didn't deserve to be fired because of his standpoint and somehow tied this into Mark Don uh, the, the tagline being Mark Donnelly saying, oh, Canada Saturday afternoon, a rally protesting provincial health orders and was fired for doing so too bad. The Canucks didn't take the same approach with Todd Bertuzzi. What? <laughs> Apparent, and this is based on the whole Bertuzzi Moore incident from 0405, which has, or sorry, like 0304, which has n nothing to do with off ice anti mask stuff. Um, and basically is saying he didn't deserve to lose his job. What I, what I don't think people seem to understand here is. Um, especially if you've been to enough Canucks games recently, you'll know that he wasn't the only singer, which would imply to me anyway, that, um, uh, it's people who don't understand the Vancouver market or anything about it talking about this. Um, first of all, on ice stuff has nothing to do with what happens off the ice for starters. That, that should be a given. What happened with Todd Bertuzzi as heinous as it was has 
absolutely no tie to something going on unrelated off the ice, all, especially considering it's been, what, over 15 years, nearly two decades? No, you can't tie those in. Those are not the same thing. Don't try and act like that's the same thing. But more importantly, um, more importantly, um, I don't think people understand that Mark Donnelly, there was a lot of people saying, oh, you can't fire someone over freedom of speech, blah, 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 blah. Mark Donnelly wasn't an employee of the team. Like, from my understanding, um, he's not an employee. He's maybe a, he's essentially a freelance artist that they paid to come in. They hired, they booked him for anthems, l the same way this anti-masker rally did, essentially. Um, he, you book them. Like, they're booked guests. Like, they're not an employee of the franchise. It basically... In other words, Francesco Aquilini didn't actually fire him so much as he said, um, we're just not going to book him for anthems anymore, like, which you are absolutely well, you are absolutely able to do. Like, that's, that's well within your right. You can choose not to keep uh, booking some, a certain act for your event if you so choose. There is nothing against that. There's no rules that, oh, that, there's no rules about that. It's empl empl if he were an actual paid employee, that's a different story. But he's not. He's a freelancer. That's why Marie Huey sang a bunch of uh, uh, anthems over the last few years. That's why a bunch of other people have come in and sang anthems for the Canucks over the last couple of years. And this is very much a key article. And a lot of other people is, you, you don't understand the Vancouver market. You shouldn't talk about it like that. You shouldn't talk about it. You have to understand who you're talking about here. Um, and again, Mark Donnelly is very, was very clearly not an employee of the team. Uh, if you understood the way the system worked in Vancouver, you would know that he's not an employee. He's, it's very much just a, okay, we're not going to give this guy any more. We're not going to book this guy for our events anymore. And you're well, and if you're the Canucks, you're well within your right to do that. Um, what did, and, uh, even like Patrick Donson kind of talked about how, uh, in light of all this, people talking about how he's probably not even an employee. Uh, whereas the guy who played Finn for the last so many years, uh, had his last day, like a few, like last week around this, I think on the same day, um, as all the Donnelly stuff broke and like that is, and that's tough. And that is a whole other thing of just awful, like just the other ramifications of COVID and everything. But at the end of the day, you are well within your right to not book an act because they decided to be stupid and, and, uh, bring awareness to an anti-mask rally. Like, what are you going to do at the end of the day? Um, j j jumping into, um, I will, we'll, we'll, we'll see. I, I feel like we'll have to see that. Um, I'm trying to decide how I want to take the direction now. Um, we'll, we'll keeping in keeping with the Canucks. Um, there was the Braden Holtby stuff that just came out yesterday. Um, essentially the, uh, just the crux of it. I'm not going to spend too much time on this because frankly, people have made way too much big a deal out of this as they already have. Um, was essentially a mask came out, uh, uh, Dave Art, uh, Dave, I, I believe his name is Dave George, uh, not, no, 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 it's, um, uh, Dave, Dave Art, Dave Art, uh, essentially he is a, right, he is a mask designer for a lot of NHL, uh, for a lot of NHL, Dave Gunnarsson, he designs a lot of Goldie masks for NHL, uh, players, for NHL players, and, uh, and for NHL goalies, including uh, all the Canucks right now, Jacob Markstrom's beforehand as well, but he also designs uh, Thatcher Demko and Mike DiPietro's as well as Braden Holtby's. Um, and essentially, this is the mask that came out. This is from a screenshot from Rob Williams. Um, it's this. It's a very. It's a mask, uh, basically a First Nations um, mask style mask um, of the e of the eagle, specifically the eagle totem pole, or the sorry, the Thunderbird totem pole. Um, down by Stanley Park, I believe, was the inspiration for this. Um, it's a very beautiful mask. Um, at from a from a pure artistry standpoint, it's gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous. I love it. But the key thing here is that this is an indigenous uh, work. Of, this is an indigenous art style that is uh, was not was painted by a person who is not. Um, indigenous, uh, a Swedish person in this case, uh, and for Bra for Braden Holpe, and this was, I'm guessing, and Holpe had part of the, and definitely had, this was, uh, now this idea was definitely also presented by, uh, Braden himself here, so, oops, uh, no music, um, it's, this, 
very much like this the the wings and everything it's a gorgeous mask but the there is this big issue there's this big issue and kind of a um i don't want i guess talking point of well who is um who is allowed to paint stuff like this who is allowed to do these kinds of art designs and a lot of people were talking about how hey it's kind of it's not great that uh, to have somebody paint indigenous art style that isn't indigenous because there's a lot of personal and story aspects to one, to that art, to that art style. Um, and, um, it makes, and, uh, it's a question of, Hey, maybe if you're not in, if you're not indigenous, maybe you're not, there's, there's a real belief that you, it's probably not, you're probably, it's probably not okay for you to be painting it. Um, I, I have my own, I have my, I don't know how I, I'm not going to say too much because, you know, I am, I'm, at the end of the day, I am a white person. I'm a white male. I have no indigenous background whatsoever. Um, so it's not my place. It's not my call at the end of the day. Uh, but I did say, you know, but there was this idea of whether or not, whether or not, um, you're, whether or not there's this, uh, you believe that like art is, um, Someone is uh, belongs to the peop belongs to the people who created it, etc. Or or not. At the end of the day, the thing that I think most people took away from it, including myself, is that hey, how hard would it be to say reach out to an indigenous artist to collaborate on this design instead versus just having Dave Gunderson paint it, just having Dave Gunderson paint it, bring in a real indigenous artist to look at it and take a good look at it, which is what I think would is great. It's a great way to showcase that art style in a way that is both okay that is both acceptable from an from a from a you let you had an indigenous person put the f uh you brought in an indigenous artist to work on it that's a perf that's a good thing that's a good you're giving an indigenous person the um the uh, ability to work on an, a high profile mask which is great and you still have dave art to f do the actual goaltending the actual put together the final product because he's the one that's used to painting on that certain canvas because you know, you, you take, there's a little bit of a, di it's different. It's a little bit different. So maybe you have, you have the two work on it and collaborate on that art style together. And I think a lot of people made that argument over the last uh, few days. And sure, uh, sure enough, the next day, uh, it was gone. The, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the image was gone off the Instagram, um, with, uh, with not, with not much warning. And, um, and then last, uh, yesterday, uh, Braden Holpe talked to, uh, CTV news and said, and apologized essentially and said, I want to, uh, this is from a passive to Bullis article that I'm quoting because, uh, he did a lot of, again, uh, Daniel does great work. Um, and he wrote, I want, uh, this is a quote from the CTV interview though. I wanted to make sure I apologize to anyone I offended. It was definitely not my intent. And I definitely learned a valuable lesson through all this all and will make sure I'm better moving forward. Holpe made it clear that he wanted to connect with his new home of Vancouver uh, by incorporating indigenous art into his mask. The goal was and still is to include indigenous and indigenous artists and try and pick their brain to see how they would design a mask to best represent the history and culture around this area, especially because it's so vast. And that's great. Like, that's fantastic. That's like, it makes, like, Brayden Holpe is already a guy who has a very good reputation, is a very good person, as somebody who fights for um, a lot of LGBT Q, um, community for the community for that community and really makes a conscious effort to be a better to and for the Black Lives Matter movement he makes a conscious effort to really uh, use his platform for good so a lot of people were very adamant like we're not mad at Holt we're not mad at him we're just saying hey maybe think about like consider it you know like consider the idea and it seems like he did and it seems like he did in a way and he didn't you know, a lot of people, when something like this happens, he made, like, it's a small, it's a mistake. It's a mistake. But a lot of people in in Holpe's shoes would be like, would just, you know, chuck the mask out and be like, well, like, be like, well, there's too much controversy, blah, 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 P make an, an issue about PC-ness and say, hey, and just do something completely different with the, and do something completely unrelated because they were like, oh, whatever I do is bad. No, this is not the case here. Brayden Holpe literally said, I'm going to do this again. We're going to do this again, but we're going to do it right. And that's fantastic. That's great to see. It makes me like Brayden Holpe even more as a person. He owned up to what was a bit of a mistake on his part. And he didn't try to like, you know, uh, push it under the rug as just other people being offended or what have you. He 
literally said, I learned a lesson. I'm going to make, and I'm going to make a conscious effort to fix it, to fix it. And that is literally all anybody asked for. And that's great. And I love that, that he, he's gone in this direction. And it really has talked about, brought up this whole argument of this whole, um, this whole ability to, for people to showcase some other art, some other artists from the First Nations community, which is great. Um, and uh, and uh, Daniel even talks about and talked to Elliot White Hill, who uh, does a lot of art pieces, and there's some great art uh, to look at in these, including this one, which is really beautiful. Um, I say, and I I learned a lot about this myself too, just because I am somebody who admittedly has really wanted um, a mask with First Nations art on it, because I personally love that art style so much. And if I ever get the chance to pay the money to do a custom goalie mask, because they're expensive, um, I've never done it before. I would, I've always thought about how I want to incorporate First Nations, uh, a First Nations design onto it because I love that style of art so much. Even, um, so now I personally have learned the, Hey, if I'm going to do that, I should absolutely reach out to somebody who is um, a First Nations artist and see if they would be willing to work on it and help me design something and put together something that would look cool, that would look great uh, if I ever do 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 go go in that direction. Um, and I, I love I liked I liked the uh, the the discourse. And again, Brain Holpe, class act all the way. Um, what was not a class act, and I'm not going to delve into that part too much, is the all the people who on who um, on Brain Holpe's behalf were or not I guess not even on his behalf because he 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 was a very good about it he was very kind and understanding about it um was oh so many people saying this is what Canucks Twitter does and oh all the a lot of people specifically blaming specific other podcasts and other voices in the market for being PC and canceling Braden Holtby which was not true that's never happened which is it's and all these people talking about how Canucks Twitter has gone so toxic and I'm so sick of blah, insert here and this person and this person. And uh, it's it's so much. It's it's too much to deal with. I'm just like, I, I don't know what to say because I'm like, on one hand, I think that's stupid. Nobody can't, nobody was, you know, nobody was trying to cancel Britain Holtby at all. Like that was never, that was, let's make this very clear. Nobody was trying to cancel him or Dave or Dave Gunnarsson, for that matter. Nobody was trying to cancel either of them by saying, hey, you should bring a First Nations artist in to do this instead. Now, uh, there might have been some people out in the community, people who I don't know, who I definitely do not know and have not seen and have not and are personally not seen, uh, at least on my timeline. Uh, uh, maybe they went and were harassing some people about it. Uh, I haven't seen it myself. Um, and certainly not from the people who were getting put, a, who a lot of the blame was being put on, certainly not from them. And it's just a boy, it's one of those things where, you know, if hockey were on right now, I don't think people would be making such a big, such a big fuss of the blame game here or trying to like point fingers at who, at who's too PC for this stuff. And I'm just like, uh, why does it matter? At the end of the day, it's a good thing. A good thing was done. Brain Holpe clearly very much understood and doesn't need doesn't need any you to inter to, to to put words in his mouth. Just you know, a good thing was done today. Let's leave it at that. Let's not say that this is some sort of turn this into some sort of circus over people who are making too big a deal of something. Because in the end, the very right and appropriate amount of deal was made over this until people started making this issue of, oh, Brayden Holtby got cancelled, which never happened. There is no can The cancel culture idea is very silly in this particular case for sure, um, because he didn't get cancelled. He's gonna, he, he, again, he made, he made very clearly made himself a, made a better human being and a better connection today as a Canuck and makes me and a lot of people like him even more as a player. Uh, as a goalie. I mean, I was already going to like him because he's a goalie, but this just makes it even easier. And so it's great to see somebody show growth. And hopefully some of the people who are, you know, going out of their way to try and be assholes to, um, you know, and saying this is there and blaming people for canceling certain other people and cancel culture and stuff. Hopefully they take something out of this and understand uh, from a, that standpoint of, hey, you know, maybe just take a step back and look at what's going on before really trying to like push a blame or some sort of narrative or blame that isn't there. 
Um, because again, a good thing was done today. A good thing, a good talk, and a good conversation about First Nations art was made today, and that's fantastic. And that's what needs to happen if uh, we're going to push forward um, to get. If we're going to push forward as a group and as a society, at the end of the day. Um, and hockey's having that all together, not from a first, I shouldn't say from a First Nation standpoint, but from a pure um, society and hockey culture standpoint. That uh, has been going on, especially in the last, this week has been, oh my God, just a huge mess. I mean, there was the, um, there obviously there was the World Junior stuff we already talked about, but um, then there was two, there was two big things broke out. Specifically, uh, both uh, were, I believe, Whit Rick West had, um, stories on the 8th, on the, which was that the Monday? It must have been, it was the Tuesday. Oh, this week has been so long. Um, the first one being, we'll stay in, we'll go in the, uh, the NHL story first, um, how a Penguins AHL coach, uh, as is, um, has filed a lawsuit against the Penguins, um, for, uh, for retaining, for firing him after he spoke out against his a head coach on an AHL head coach for their for the Penguins affiliate for assaulting his wife for sexually assaulting his wife. Um, that came out. The um, uh, Jared Scaldi, uh, a form was the a former assistant coach of the Penguins. This is from a Wick, Rick Westhead article. Um, um, uh, alleges in a lawsuit filed November third in U.S. District Court in Pennsylvania that when Wilkes Barre Scranton head coach Clark Donatelli assaulted his wife Erin. That, that then the coach fire, assaulted his wife, Aaron, when the three of them were in a car together during a team road trip in Providence. The allegations against the Penguins, the Lemieux group, and have not been proven yet. Um, but uh, I'm not going to go into all the gross, the gross details of it because you can look at it. I will include a link for it if you want to read it because it's kind of, a, it's, it's very upsetting and I don't want to read it out loud. It's just a lot. Um, but basically, um, alleges he alleges that um, seven, that seven months later, when the incident was brought to the attention of Penguins general man, assistant general manager Bill Guerin, whose duties oversee, included overseeing the NHL team's AHL operation, Guerin told Scaldi to keep quiet about the alleged assault, and that um, uh, uh, Guerin, who is of course now the Minnesota Wild general manager, um, and declined to comment on it. Um, uh, he was later, they did not immediately report to it, uh, Donatelli, uh, resigned quietly, um, I believe, or some, where is it, um, allegedly, yeah, uh, on 20, in last year, in June of last year, Donatelli had resigned for personal reasons, and then, uh, during last season, they stripped Scaldi of his duties coaching the power play units, and then fired him, um, he believes that his termination had, and he believes his termination had to do with the whistleblowing issue aspect, and not um, the, uh, and not his actual perform his on ice performance. Um, uh, it's just so much. I mean, I can't comment on it much more than this because again, it's all in court, but Jesus, if this is true, if this turns out to be true, like the, this just, this is a huge issue. Um, and just the, not even just the forgetting, even the aspect of they fired him for saying something, which is bad enough. Just the idea that they let it, that they had him keep quiet for so long and then just let the other guy resign uh, without making a deal about it. Because without, you know, going to police or going to um, any sort of, or going to any sort of law enforcement about this, because this is, this is a crime. Like, this is a crime. If it's, if it, if this ends up being true, this was a crime that was committed. And essentially the penguins didn't do anything about it which could which looks horrible and then it looks bad especially on bill garen who is now the gm of the minnesota wild and um how he's decided to keep quiet on this as well i mean i don't know how much he can say because it's in court but still um what if this seems more or less if this it does i mean i guess technically the truth uh, it does uh, i guess i could say that it is true that this happened because I mean, again remember i've got to try and keep because i'm media personality personal personnel i have to keep legalese in mind when i talk about it um uh i don't i i don't know if they're uh, if the penguins are saying are saying yes this did happen but this is not why he was fired sort of thing 
Um, because if that did, that means they're admitting this did happen, which is bad, which is admittedly a, hey, you did a, sh that's a, a shitty thing. Um, it's just all around awful. That was so bad. And hopefully this, uh, you know, justice is done here. Um, and then same day, um, the more affidavits were add to a, added to a hazing and abuse, harassment and hazing in junior hockey, um, class action lawsuit against the CHL, the Canadian Hockey League, Hockey League, on the major junior leagues being the WHL, uh, the OHL, and the QMJHL. Um, and a lot of affidavits and were signed in a lot of players, uh, most of which were anonymous, talking about the harassment and the abuse they suffered uh, in the levels of junior hockey, specifically in regards to the hazing rituals that usually come in at, those, at that level. Um, again, a lot of this is stuff that I don't necessarily want to repeat. I want to say out loud because it, it's very upsetting. Um, but this stuff, like, it's shocking. Like, it, like I mean, you can see it if you're watching the video version of this. You can see some of this, and I will include a link to this as well in the description um, of this of this uh, episode. It, it's, it's absolutely shocking. Again, I have been in hockey culture in that junior, in the junior, not in this level of juniors, absolutely not even close. But I've been, I've played college hockey. I've seen a little bit of, I haven't seen, I've seen some, some stuff. I've seen some stuff happen at that level and at other levels. Um, but this was shocking to me. Like, this is like, from what, like, this makes anything that I saw at my, in my time playing the game, in my time playing the game at those level, at the, at the college and even the minor hockey level, uh, look like nothing. This is, some of this stuff is just, com like, absolutely, like, shocking. I mean, I'll say some of the stuff. There was, um, okay, if you're of the faint of heart, I would skip ahead to the, I will, I think I'll include a, I'll include a timestamp here, um, where it's safe to, to, to say, if you don't want to hear this, because again, this is not for the faint of heart, some of the stuff that has gone on on this list. There was, uh, one player talking about how, um, he was, uh, player from the 67s talked about he was blindfolded. The older players held him, held me down, tied me up, and took off my clothes. I was naked. They shaved my genitals. They slapped me around. They threw cold water and hot water over me. They covered my genitals and rub A535. It was terrifying and extremely painful. I believe rub is like a, it's like um, it's like a very painful, like hot, like like um, sticky substance. I don't know exactly what it is, uh, but I believe it's like something that like it's like burns. It burns essentially. Um, there was other talk about how, um, you know, there was, uh, they would tie, somebody said they would tie a skate lace to your penis and throw it over a venting pipe and then tie the other end to a bucket and then throw pucks into the bucket, um, and see how long the player could hold on for, which is just fucking ghastly. I'm just, it's, I assume, like this, I'm, I'm not kidding you. Like, Reading this stuff, again, none of this happen has happened to me or anything that I've seen. Nothing like this has ever happened. I've never seen anything like this in my life. This shocked, this shocked me to a, like, and I was just sitting there thinking, like, I got tired and depressed reading this because it's so awful that you can let this stuff happen at that level. I can, I, but at the same time, I'm, it shocked me and yet, sadly, it, doesn't like I'm not surprised at the same time that this kind of stuff was happening um because I and I'm not gonna say that this is hockey specific because I you know I'm sure there's stuff like this that goes on in other sports programs I mean I mean even like stuff that some of the stuff that's considered legal and well known like um the stuff at the NCAA level um could the the issues surrounding NCAA and college sports in the U.S. could fill a book, but this is, but that doesn't excuse this at all, and I just remember, and I'm just like, I read this on Tuesday, and just looking at it, just, I, I both couldn't believe it, and could absolutely at the same time, and it's just, and it's just disgusting, and it's awful that this is the kind of harassment and stuff that players had to deal with at this level, and hearing some players, especially, particularly uh, certain players who have since come out as um, gay has come out as gay 
um, or other or otherwise um, LGBT uh, part of the LGBT or um, you know or identify as another gender altogether or some sort of thing. Talk about how this is why they uh, th this is why there isn't um, a this isn't this is why there isn't a, uh, a, pr an, a player in the NHL an openly gay player in the NHL yet because this kind of stuff basically scares you into ever coming out or just in the sense of it's it, and even from a purely just everybody standpoint this kind of stuff just scars players the players like it the amount of mental damage the mental damage and psychological damage this does to can do to a player is just awful and it's so sad to see that this is still going on and especially because this scare this they, this puts players out from ever wanting to play hockey again. I mean, we saw the the torment Akeem Malou faced not just as a as a black man playing hockey, but as a rookie who refused to take part in hazing rituals and the absolute torment and shit he had to deal with from his own teammates. Remember, for not going through with them, it's just awful and depressing, and it makes me so sad uh, as somebody who loves hockey so much like i love this game so damn much and again all i want to do with this platform and again all i always say it albeit the small platform that i have the, my only hope that i can get out of this is um trying to i want as i hope that i can leave hockey culture and the the, the culture of the game in a better place than i left it um because this is because I've been given this very lucky ability to talk about this on a weekly basis that some other people might not be afforded the a, a, the ability to, and I want to use it for good as much as possible and as much as I possibly can, and you know I I've I've experienced some I don't want to say uh, I don't want to say bullying because I think that's overly i think from at least from my opinion that's for me in my personal experiences that's overly dramatic um but i've seen some stuff and i understand and i understand at the very least that what these players are dealing with makes anything i've seen in my lifetime look like nothing and it's and it's and but i also understand that sometimes this makes you hate what you do and it makes you hate your own your own ability like some of the stuff like just from the purely like day-to-day -day stuff like not even just the you know sometimes the torment you do with just some of the things that i have had said to me in my career our career of playing at minor hockey at the things that have been said to me or to players i've played with um or the stuff that's been done to those players on the ice or what have you the stuff that i've seen uh like it made me it didn't make me hate the game it just made me hate kind of the overall the overall landscape around it like i admittedly like i mean as i mean especially like i have like i i always when i was younger i considered my hockey play the hockey players i played with the, my closest friends fast forward to today i don't talk to really any of them like i have a couple friends uh, like I have a couple of people who I sometimes have a chat with, like I had some, there was like, uh, my favorite team, and I've talked about this on the podcast before, my favorite team I ever played with, and I will say them by name because they were not like this at all, was the Oakland Bears team I played with in 2013, 2014. That team was, there was like, there, it, that team was truly like a family and they treated, every player treated their teammates with respect there was one player who didn't and he was quickly booted off the team not because of something he did off the ice although i think there was some stuff that was just that bothered me to my core for sure um but something he did in a game uh unrelated um but that team what i loved about it so much and playing on that group is that everybody respected each other so much and they play and everybody on that team was so nice and well and um and did, there was there was a real team and family mentality to the group and i didn't hear any of the sort of stuff and there was no, i didn't hear nearly some of the awful stuff i didn't hear any of the awful stuff that i heard on some of the other teams i played for um in that locker room ever they were a very understood yeah they were a they were the 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 the, the players and their their um 
their mindset were so years behind beyond their age um i always loved and i respected the hell out of that team and those guys i got to play i had the absolute fortune of playing with and i think it's no coincidence that that was the best team skills wise i ever played on was because of how respectful and how and how how highly they held what high standards they held themselves to they we held ourselves to even as what 16 18 year olds like we're kids we were kids like the people are like kids will be kid people shouldn't be punished for the mistakes they make as kids i saw a team able to know the difference between some of the stuff that that's going on here at that age at that age even if it wasn't at as high a level i saw kids being a proving every single day that you can be a res that you can be a good person and a high and a and hold yourself to a higher standard of how you treat your own teammates and your opponents on the ice. I've seen it firsthand that it can be done. And it makes you a better team for it, I think, at the end of the day. And I loved I loved that group. I still love those guys. I don't talk to them enough as much as I should, admittedly. But they're a great group. And I'm, uh, I, I hope more team... I hope I can, from learning, from being able to play on that team, and from seeing what a difference it can make, that hopefully I can use this platform to make... Again, leave hockey in a better place than it was before. I really hope teams come out of this under and players specifically the young generate this next generation because at the end of the day that's what it's all that's gonna. It, this might help with the coaching and the management stuff that might go on and how they let some stuff slide, how they let stuff slide. But at the end of the day, if the player the players will find a way to either keep these kind of situations going or stop it all together it's up to that next generation of hey treat your your teammates whether they're rookies no matter they're your older veteran 20 year old guys to the young new kids coming in treat them with respect treat them how you would want to be treated and how and make make the rink a welcoming place and a and a and a and a place that players want to be not just because they have aspirations of an NHL, of making the NHL, or that big paycheck or what have you that might come uh, if they play well enough. Make it a welcoming place for everybody. Make them feel comfortable and welcoming among, in that room, even in that short window that you're playing together. Because I think it, because it will go a long way to not only just for them, but when the next crop of players under them, and it's their turn to lead a team, they will do the same and then and then some and then some and treating them and over time it'll work its way out a little bit more and more each day until hopefully it's gone like some of the more some of the most egregious stuff is out of the game and hopefully people will do that over time and hopefully this that's what i think will bring the most attention to this at the end of the day is hopefully it changes in that regard um that was heavy stuff. There's some heavy stuff today. I, I wasn't kidding when I said this was going to be a bit of a heavy episode and I didn't want to bring anyone else into this. Um, what else is there? What else is there quickly? Um, a Wayne Gretzky rookie card sold for 1.29 million US, which is crazy. Um, I wonder. I actually wonder. My stepdad has a uh, collection of old hockey cards. I don't know what years they're from. I don't think it's... I definitely am darn sure it's not from that year. But I, I want to go through those cards at some point because there was apparently he had a, he had like full collections of some stuff and I would love to see some of um, them in the eras that they're from. Uh, they're they're in storage somewhere, not here, uh, but uh, in a I I, I want to see them at some point. Um, the Panthers quickly on the Panthers uh, and not just because of uh, my, bo my 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 good buddy Roberto Luongo, uh, my my absolute hero. <laughs> Uh, Roberto Luongo um, overseeing. Essentially, they announced that the the Panthers announced that they're going to be establishing a goaltending excellence department, um, and essentially made up of Luongo uh, goalie coach, uh, his brother Leo, um, the Panthers' current goalie coach Rob Tallis, and uh, a new consultant Francois Allaire, who's been around the game for a very long time. Essentially, they're going to be building this system uh, to coordinate overseeing coaching development and scouting. For goaltenders uh, at every level of the 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 fran at the of the teams the team has hands on not just the NHL level but the a the AHL goalies and the ECHL goalies and I saw some people asking how is this any different from what teams do now 
I don't, a lot of teams from my, from what I have seen, goaltending is very much just thrown in with everything else. Like, I think like, not in the sense of it's thought, it's an afterthought, but so much of as people, I don't think sometimes there's this misstep of goaltending is different from the developing and built and drafting and developing goalies is different from the way you develop and pick skaters. It's, it, it sounds like in your, like when you hear that, you probably think that sounds perfectly logical, right? But it, in pra in practice, it kind of gets lost in the shuffle. Like a lot of like teams know that, but they also kind of forget when it comes down to the actual development side of, of things. And I think a lot of teams kind of look at their goalies and say, there's a one size fits all setup here. And they kind of, um, and they kind of let goaltenders live or die foul by the wayside. Like I've seen this in goaltending before where a lot of great goalies are undone because are un, are un, their careers are undone a little bit because uh, they're tried because either a coach, a goalie coach or a team or a management group will come in, try to completely change them because something that worked for a different goaltender should clearly should work for this guy, even though they're different people. Goalies are one of those breeds, like just like the skaters, frankly, where there isn't one, there isn't one true system to build the perfect goaltender. Every player, every goalie is unique. Every way that they get, they find and achieve success is different. For example, like um, there's been a noticeable, for example, there's been a very noticeable um, uh, upright, uptick in goalies being left in the AHL for years before they're given their NA, their before they're even given their chance at at the NHL team. Uh, Jordan Bennington was a big example of that. Uh, Matt Murray was a very big example of that as well. And I think Scott Wedgwood as well. Or was, it, was it Scott Wedgwood? Not a, no no no. Uh, Mackenzie Blackwood. Thank sorry. Um, was the other one. There's been a big uptick in goalies just being left to marinate at the AHL level. Uh, and then coming and finding success later on, but a lot of goaltenders being left there um, as a result. Now, for those goaltenders, that was fine, that works, but a lot of teams have started doing that uh, to all of their goaltenders um, because they assume, well, this is the way that we get success out of goalies these days. Even though, frankly, there are lots of goaltenders uh, who could easily step in at 19, 20, as young as 19 or 20, into an NHL role immediately and be successful. Like Carter Hart is pretty young, if I if I remember correctly. Like Carter Hart is only, I believe, twenty one. I believe he's the same age. He is. He's a little younger than me, I believe, isn't he? Twenty two. He's twenty two, um, and he's already a great goal. He's already a complete stalwart for the Flyer for the Philadelphia Flyers. Um, but even he was kind of left a couple years uh, over ripened a little bit at the AHL level. Um, and what I think this is going to do for the Panthers, it sounds like it's going to be a, like they talk about consistent communication, guidance, and, um, oops, that's the wrong button, uh, uniformed, uh, unified instruction from the goaltending excellence staff, um, and, uh, covering all of the, oh, Leo Luongo is the goalie coach of the, the Charlotte Checkers as well, um, is what I think this is going to mean at the end of the day is not that they're going to and is very importantly is hope is that they're not going to just say there's one style that fits all which and because it's the goal and the goalies because all of these guys running this are goaltenders or former goalies whether at an nhl level or not um they're going to understand that okay we know goalies enough to say here's what's going to work for this goaltender here's what's going to work for this one here's going to what's going to work for this one and here's who we should pick for and we'll develop in our system successfully if we pick them at the draft this sort of thing and we'll help with the goaltending side of things because frankly you'd be surprised at how much uh management uh specific, standard management don't know a lot about goalies like they just don't like that's and that's not necessarily a fault of their own because frankly they're only out, uh, if you're a coach or something, for example, if you're a head coach, only two of your of your of your players on your roster are goalies. The other eighteen are skaters. So it makes more sense that you're going to know a whole lot more about how to help develop the players, and it's going to be more or less your job to develop the players. And that's why they have a goalie coach on hand specifically to develop 
your bat your 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 netminders. Um, but sometimes that gets lost in the upper management shuffle. So I'm very excited to see um, how the Panthers do this, especially considering what an awful year Sergei Bobrovsky had um, at the NHL level. And the goal and the Panthers have long had a bit of an issue um, at developing at developing players, uh, goalies at that level. Like Luongo, remember, keep in mind, Luongo is really the on, only goalie who has found success at the Panthers level, at the, at the, at, who's found long-term success playing for the Florida Panthers. And A, he did not, and first of all, most importantly, that was, that his, his best years as a Panther came in the early 2000s when he was a lot younger. Um, and number two, his peak years didn't even come with the Panthers. They came in Vancouver, which again, which we talked about last episode of and why he should have his jersey retired and he will have his jersey retired. And not just by this podcast as I quickly scan the camera up to show you, hey, what is that? Is that a Luongo banner hanging from my hanging from the lights? I'll have to do like a <laughs> I'll have to do a, a, a jersey retirement ceremony for like the YouTube channel or something where we have, where I officially retire Luongo's number for the crease cast for the podcast. Um, but it, that's the thing at the end of the day, the, from a purely, from a franchise standpoint, there have not been a, no goaltenders have really come in through the Panthers system over the last many years and found success. Jacob Markstrom famously did not do well with the Panthers, uh, in the Panthers system and only found success when they traded him to the Canucks and was given the time to really work on his skills and was given the right coaching. And it, it finally clicked. And now he's one of the best goalies in the NHL. And now he's a flame, which is very sad. But I digress. That's another thing. I digress. The Panthers were in desperate need of finding goaltending, goalie coaching that works for them and finding a way, and finding a new setup that works for, for, that will work to helping better understand and develop their goaltending talent. Because Right now, it's a it's a bit of a mess for them, and the Panthers and some and in a lot of cases, goaltending has out has, especially last season, really undid the Panthers. Frankly, um, as we just look into the as I look into kind of the teams and who they've got coming up through that system, um, and I try and pull up the uh, the depth chart here as quickly as I possibly can for the Panthers. I know obviously Bobrovsky. Um, I saw the Canucks. Play. I saw the Canucks Panthers game earlier this year where Sam Montembeau started for the Panthers and unfortunately got really lit up. Got lit up by the Canucks in the first period uh, and uh, ended up getting hooked for Bobrovsky in that game. Um, they have guys like Spencer Knight coming through, who I think was drafted actually at the. Uh, he was drafted, I believe, at the the that was the that was the Vancouver that was the Vancouver draft, if I remember correctly. I remember them drafting a goalie. Um, if, if I'm, unless I'm very much mistaken. Yes, that was 2019. That was 13th overall. I was at that, uh, I was at that draft night. Um, Spencer Knight, uh, Chris Dre, Dreiger, if I've got that pronounced correctly, he's under contract. There's a lot of goalies coming through that system that could be quite good for them. Um, if get, that could be quite good if given the opportunity. Uh, Sam Montembeau still under contract? Unsigned. He is not, he's not signed. He's probably an RFA if I'm, Unless I'm uh, unless I'm wrong here, um, but either way, the Panthers are in desperate need of fixing what's been plaguing them in the net and why they haven't been able to develop a goaltender properly since Roberto Luongo. And even then, how those best the best eras the best years of Luongo's career came in Vancouver. So what? And so hopefully, this is a system that he knows well, and he will figure out a way, and he and the that team will figure out to get done. I like the Panthers. I have a soft spot for Florida. I quite like them. And uh, I hope they find, and I do kind of hope they find success in, in Florida. I, do, I, do, I don't want to see that team relocate if it's possible, frankly. I know that's weird, but I do, I do, I, I do really want to see Florida find some, some st stable, true success. Um, la a few couple more things before we get out of here. I'm uh, going to touch on a couple very quick um, uh, uh, good mo good things you should look at, or grass, or good. Uh, th uh, I, I'll we'll just say some nice things to look at. Um, there has, I guess this is kind of starts from a sad place, but um, there is a bar in Seattle, a hockey bar in Seattle that has been part of the community for a very long time, uh, called the Angry Beaver, 
and it looks crazy and i can't believe i only ever heard of it until now but uh because of covid19 it has struggled and it is uh there's a lot of and it's running and it's absolutely close to running out of business which is not good um and i uh oh i've got the wrong page up um but essentially um there is um but essentially they're running out of money uh someone has set up a gofundme for the bar to try and keep it afloat um and i'm gonna definitely include a link to that um it's at right now they need about fifty thousand they need about fifty thousand dollars they have raised almost thirty five thousand so that's fantastic um so if you can give to that that would be great um i definitely i definitely would love to see that team that that bar live to see its seattle hockey team come into play um if i have the uh the uh the link up here yeah um so definitely go check that out i'll include a link to that as well as i'll include a link to um i'll include this as well uh, a friend of a uh, friend of the show david quadrelli uh announcing that uh he's going to be doing a private match fundraiser on call of duty Warzone uh for uh in honor uh in honor of dave nord nordam who's uh who also follows me on twitter uh he's a ni very nice guy who's fighting cancer who's battling cancer right now in cancer treatments um, so far, uh, they are also doing a GoFundMe, which has raised only 15,000, uh, 15, but still good. Uh, but they're doing essentially uh, a, a Call of Duty Warzone uh, event on this Friday. Uh, so this today, you're getting this on Monday. You're getting this recording on Monday. So in a few days from now, um, basically, if you donate 15 bucks... Uh, you enter. You can get a team in this uh, this game. I'm going to. I think I'm going to do it. I'm gonna. I I don't have any players, but I'm going to. I I think I'm going to, um, try and quickly cobble together a team and play. Um, but at the very least, if you even if you don't like playing uh uh shooter games, um, you should consider donating to Dave. He really needs uh, help. He's been going through a lot lately, and um, hopefully this can uh hopefully you will go and check it out. Um, it's only 15 to enter the tournament, but if you want to just give more out of the goodness of your heart, that's always, always appreciated. Um, and I think that's, that's good. That's going to cover it from, from me. Um, the one other thing I'll just briefly, briefly touch on, um, because I'm saving this for a, for the Patreon more or less is Disney is, uh, the, the new, the trailer for the brand new Mighty Ducks series dropped the other day, which is supposed to come out, I believe, next year. Um, or they haven't announced an official date yet. But uh, this was being filmed in Vancouver. Emilio Estevez is back. Uh, and it, I saw the trailer. Um, and, oh my god, it looks really, really good. Like, it looks almost better than the original series. Um, which is shocking. Which is great. Because the original series, like, as beloved as it is, and how it spawned an NHL team... Um, it's not the best at actually, it's not necessarily the best at representing how hockey works in any way. Uh, yes, there's obviously artistic, uh, there's, there's room for artistic, um, uh, um, invi or what's, I, I don't remember what the word I'm looking for is here, but like the, uh, uh, interpret, artistic interpretation for a movie, especially for a comedy movie, like there's room, you can kind of stretch it a little you have to kind of stretch it a little bit sometimes to make it work for to make it interesting for hollywood but uh this show looks a little bit not only does it look more true to what hockey is it looks fan it looks like a really good insight into what hockey and what sports have turned into since and i love this aspect now where essentially the idea of the ducks the ducks have since basically the main synopsis behind it is that the ducks have um become since the the days of the charlie conway and adam banks era have become this powerhouse and have become the very team, the very, uh, the very organization that they fought, that they played against, like the Hawks and how, uh, overly comp competitive and just how they would cut and, and, uh, ruthless they became and how this new story revolves around a new team rising up to try and compete against the OG Ducks. And I love that aspect. It looks, it looks great. I really, really hope uh, that this series, because again, this is not a movie. This is a this is a TV series, which is great. I think this is. I think the Mighty Ducks are a perfect um, uh, story to. Or perfect. This kind of story is perfect for a series and for a mini series, especially on Disney Plus. 
Um, I think it looks good. I really, really hope it's good. I think it could, and because frankly, if it is, I think it would easily be, a, it could easily be the best hockey media movie or TV series ever if it, if it sticks the landing from what the trailer looks like. Damn, it looks fantastic. And how, um, but anyway, I'm not going to talk too much about the Disney stuff because there was a lot of Disney talk. There's a lot of Disney things announced this week that looked really cool and I'm very excited about. But I'm going to leave that for the Patreon episode because this episode is already getting long and there's already been uh, a lot of stuff today. Um, and with that, uh, just to quickly plug a few things that I have been working on, a few, announcement, a few announcements. Um, speaking of the ducks, I did an article recently on LockInTheCrease.com about uh, an old uh, documentary I found on... Uh, on YouTube about the inaugural season of the original NHL, Mighty, the Mighty Ducks of Anaheim NHL team. Um, I talked about that. Um, Mystery Hockey Theater, it's kind of a new series I'm trying uh, where I kind of, literally I just go looking for YouTube, doc, for documentaries on YouTube about teams um, and like players and NHL players and stuff. And um, ideally it's going to be a series where uh, you guys submit ideas and stuff you would want me to cut like and and um documentaries that i should cover so if you like watching youtube finding weird old nhl youtube media on here on the on on the internet uh please do uh send me the links send the links my way um um ideally uh to make this work uh it should be a youtube or something at the very least it should not be behind a paywall so nothing like on disney plus or espn or tsn it shouldn't be it should be something that anyone with an internet connection can get to because i think that's kind of the inherent idea is this should be something that anybody can watch um more or less um Hopefully try like something a little close to about a half an hour show would be good but I'm if it, you find something great uh, that's under that time frame, by all means, send it anyway. Um, so keep, uh, hopefully you'll go check that out. Um, but more importantly, as I take a quick water break, um, cause my throat is getting, uh, scratchy. Um, just, uh, as you might've noticed, uh, just a quick and a cool, very cool announcement that I'm very excited about. Um, as you might've noticed on the cover of the show, uh, if you're watching this, if you're listening to this is, uh, I got a new, we got a new logo, uh, Huge shout out to my mom, uh, Cla Claudia Little, for uh, designing for designing headphones for the goalie mask on the uh, on the uh, the logo. But uh, more excitingly, because we have a, a logo that I am very proud of, I uh, I recently opened up a store. Uh, we have an actual Creasecast store. Uh, on teespring.com slash lock in the uh, slash stores slash lock in the crease with a couple items with the goalie mask on it um, Just a few items for now um, That you should please go check out if you enjoyed the show um, Consider checking out the store. I will include a link to that um, it, um, Just like with the, with the mask on them. There's a lot of different designs. I tried to keep as many under under for under 30 buck as many items as possible under $30 uh, for Canadian for you to check out and hopefully, uh, check, take a look and purchase. Um, uh, I'm very excited about this. Uh, if you do so, it really helps me. It really helps support what I do and helps me keep the, 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 the podcast and the show, uh, the podcast and the website running, uh, helps pay my bills, which, you know, like I, I do, I do everything on my own for this show more or less. Um, so if you can, if you can help uh, and you want something tangible, this is a great way to do it, to buy a, a cool shirt. Or if there's a design that I don't have yet that you would like and that you would want to purchase if I made it, let me know. Uh, the only thing that's not on here yet that I do have, have in the works is stickers. Uh, those are coming, uh, though, but I'm doing those a different way. Um, and, uh, but at the very least, uh, the crease cast, if you enjoyed the show and you want more of the crease cast, please check out my Patreon as already mentioned recently. Um, patreon.com slash lock in the crease for three bucks a month you get bonus uh you get bonus episodes of the show and i just did one last week uh where i tier ranked all my all the bet all the best disney or not disney christmas uh specials and movies of all time i tier listed them um or at least the ones i've seen uh and i did an hour and a half of that which was very fun and uh and fascinating look into the into how many christmas 
uh, movies there are, really. I never really thought about it. Um, and that's not even including all the garbage, like, Hallmark ones. Um, so do check that out. Uh, again, for only only three bucks a month, lots of bonus episodes. And I'll be doing that Disney one pretty shortly here. Um, if you, and, uh, or at the very least, please, uh, check out my website, uh, new articles come out as frequently as possible, uh, lockinthegrease.com. You can also follow me on Twitter in and Instagram at lockinthecrease and the show on both of those platforms as well at the Creasecast. Uh, and, um, make sure to subscribe on Spotify, leave a review on Apple podcasts. Again, greatly appreciated. The free things you can do are greatly appreciated. Share the links and everything. Um, follow, um, yeah, make sure to subscribe on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google, whatever po place you get your podcasts, as well as YouTube. Check out our YouTube channel where I post highlights and other and other fun goodies as well. Um, as, as well. And uh, yeah, with that, thank you so much for listening. This has been the Creasecast. Hope you're hope we are rounding the corner. Um, oh, one last thing I should mention as uh, you know, as we as we get on out of here, this episode has been very tough and tough like frankly it was very tough for me even to sit down to, to talk about all these things because it's it's just been such a depressing dark week in my opinion but if you want some good news if if there is any good news to take out of this week uh and this popped up on my uh on my feed on my feed today is that the first uh on, on twitter uh, right as i was about to record is that the first uh doses of the covid vaccine 19 vaccine uh not only left the, the states, they have now touched down in Canada. So, and obviously there was the story earlier this week of the first woman in the UK receiving the vaccine. And frankly, that's, if there's right now, there is no better news than that at the end of the day, really. Uh, because the sooner the, vac the sooner vaccines are made widespread available, the sooner, hey, we're able to go outside again. We don't have to wear masks to the store anymore. And we can actually go about a more or less normal life again. It's been a long time and I think everybody deserves a break from that. And hopefully uh, that comes when this, as this vaccine is more readily available. Until, but until that day, uh, please keep wearing your mask, washing your hands, keeping social, practicing social distancing, uh, ordering from local foods, uh, ordering from local places and keep and shopping local as much as you possibly can, especially during this holiday season. Uh, where you'll be doing a lot of Christmas shopping, I'm sure. Uh, thank you so much for listening. I have been Lachlan Irvin, uh, and, uh, I will see you, uh, next, and I will see you next time. Uh, good night. And, oop, that didn't play. Where'd it go? There we go. Good night.